Hey lore lovers, my name is Eric with the Lorebrarian's YouTube channel. The year 2020 is closing its final chapter, and a lot has happened in the multiverse of Magic the Gathering. The Planeswalker Elspeth overcame death, and gods were humbled in our return to Theros. We then learned of Ikoria, the plane of massive behemoths, and quick, sometimes unsuspected mutations. And we were witness to a Zendikar without the Eldrazi, healing from old wounds and on the rise. We've learned of new characters and new planeswalkers, an artificially created spark, and ancient or mysterious artifacts that hint at a larger conflict that could be weaving itself into existence underneath the surface. We have as much to look forward to in the year 2021 as we have to look back on. Wizards has announced their releases for the calendar year, and call time spoilers are mere days away if they've not already begun. I wanted to dedicate a video for my predictions of what will befall the multiverse in the next year. By scrutinizing this year's sets, we may glean some information into the future of the MTG story. I'll first discuss the new sets and the information we have on them, then share my own thoughts and predictions on what may unfold in the year 2021. These are of course just theories and should be taken as such. I'd love to hear yours in the comments below. But before we begin, if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if Magic the Gathering is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel where lore videos are uploaded weekly. The support is much appreciated. Alright, let's dive in. We'll begin our predictions on the Norse-inspired frozen world of Kaldheim, the titular plane of the Kaldheim set to be released on February 5th. This will be the first in-depth exploration of Kaldheim with a full set, but it isn't the first time we've seen the plane. The plane was first mentioned in the original Plains Chase, in which Skybreen appeared as a plane card. A mountain range where barbaric nomads may take up residence, the abilities of the card hint at either Kaldheim's or Skybreen's personality, a place of prognostication and ponderings, but that is resistant to such futures becoming reality. The plane acted as either the homeworld or the base of operations for the planeswalker Ramaz, a crazed shaman and disciple of the elder dragon Nicol Bolas. Ramaz instigated Chandra Nalar into stealing the dragon scroll, an item that held the secret to the spirit dragon Ugin's ghostfire, and ultimately led to the release of the Eldrazi on Zendikar. We've just recently been given a first look into the new planeswalkers, characters, and world of Kaldheim. It's a plane of heroes and warriors, of thrilling tales, stunning battles, and glory seeking. From the information spoiled thus far, the ghost assassin in Planeswalker Kaya is the central character of this story. Kaya was last seen tracking down Liliana Vess, the necromancer and pawn of Nicol Bolas during the War of the Spark, on Liliana's home plane of Dominaria. After a short conflict and deliberation, she helped Liliana create a new life for herself on the plane of Fiora, under the pseudonym Anna Iora. Kaya then stated that she had unfinished business on her home plane of Tolvada, which appears to have been cursed or diseased by Nicol Bolas for reasons yet unknown. Clearly Kaldheim isn't Tolvada, but it may hold answers for how Kaya can save her plane. Kaldheim is rich with legends and myths and gods, and it happens to be suffused with spirits and the ghosts of those long departed. As a partially ethereal being herself, Kaya has a proclivity for interacting with ghosts, which may be why she is drawn to Kaldheim. By entreating the gods or the spirits, or by walking their path as Kaya may be able to do, she may very well acquire the object or knowledge needed to fulfill her desires. Her path and mission on Kaldheim could be the focus of the conflict and story of the plane, as others seek to undo her. One such character is Tybalt, a devilish planeswalker that feeds off of and is drawn to others' pain and misery. He tormented Chandra Nalar in the Chandra comic series and landed himself on the frozen tundra of Kaldheim. With warriors and berserkers at each other's throats, fickle gods delivering punishment, and an afterlife that may be similar to Theros' underworld, there is certainly plenty of misery to go around. As an anarchist, Tybalt's motives aren't terribly precise, and he lacks serious long-term goals. Perhaps he is here merely to torment Kaya and the other inhabitants of Kaldheim. Which brings us to two new planeswalkers making their debut in this set, one a native of the plane, the other merely a visitor. They are Tyvar Kel and Nico Aris. Tyvar is an elf, an Aenir of Kaldheim that held the status of gods until they were defeated by the Skoti that now reside in the pantheon of divine beings. Their defeat fractured the elves between wood elves and shadow elves, and they lived alienated from another for many years. Tyvar's older brother, Harold, united the clans under his kingship, and Tyvar seeks his own ambitions. A bellicose and arrogant warrior, Tyvar's purpose is to create his own story and myth that will exceed the great heroes of Kaldheim. To this end, I predict the elven planeswalker may come face to face with the Skoti, the gods that so unjustly usurped power from Tyvar's ancestors. 
Our second planeswalker has had their share of gods, but from a different plane. Nico Aris is a native of Theros, a plane that has as celestial rulers its own pantheon of gods. From a young age, Nico was touched by destiny and prophesied to be the greatest athlete and javelinier, one who would never miss a shot. Nico was disillusioned by their determined fate and sought to challenge destiny itself. When they purposefully lost the competition, Nico realized that they were in control of their own destiny, not a slave to it, which ignited their planeswalker spark and set them on a new course. But to go against destiny on Theros is to go against Clothis and her agents. Although Nico could flee the god, Clothis's newly created planeswalker Calyx isn't bound to the plane and may be in hot pursuit. It isn't much surprise that Nico has arrived on Kaldheim, a plane similar to Theros in its mythology and worship of gods. Perhaps Nico has come to Kaldheim to find a god that they can truly devote themselves to, or perhaps, not content to challenge the gods of Theros, they have come to challenge those of Kaldheim as well. I can see Nico being opposed to the pantheon of Kaldheim, seeing it as nothing more than a way to imprison the inhabitants. The stories of all four planeswalkers seem to be centered around the gods in the pantheon of Kaldheim, and their confrontations will be sure to shake the plane to its core, even destroying the gods themselves. The next magic set to be released next year also introduces us to an entirely new plane. It is Strixhaven School of Mages. Strixhaven is the name of the school around which the set revolves, but it's unclear whether the plane shares its name. What we do know is that the school is the most elite academy and proving ground for mages in all the multiverse. Five different colleges make up the university, each with their specialized form of magic, and each likely affiliated with a specific color of mana. The most intriguing story of Strixhaven lies in that of Kasmina, a polymorphist and user of control magic. She first made an appearance in War of the Spark as the enigmatic mentor, and it's my prediction that we will see her once again in Strixhaven. For one, she is a mentor, a tutor that would be right at home in the School of Mages. Her planeswalker ability also creates wizards, perhaps pupils of hers from Strixhaven. Additionally, the illustration of the card Kasmina's Transmutation shows a Strix flying over the wizard's shoulder, which happens to be the emblem of the set. But things only get more interesting from here. In the book titled The Art of MTG War of the Spark by James Wyatt, we get a small snippet of information that introduces backstory to Kasmina's character. It states that she is the leader of an ancient and secret order of planeswalkers, a shadowy cabal with mysterious aims. Her larger goals are unknown, but her recent obsession is recruitment. Her preferred method is to identify what she calls embers, non-ignited planeswalkers. She helps these mages to discover their potential, even if it means causing trauma to ignite their spark, and then indoctrinates them in the ways of her order. She's preparing for a looming conflict that dwarfs the War of the Spark. This little paragraph is loaded with information that will fuel the imagination of the theory crafters and conspiracists in the months to come, and I predict Kasmina and her goals will be a central driving force for the overarching MTG story for many sets into the future. We aren't told if she created the Order or if she was even alive during its inception, but as the lead recruiter for Planeswalkers, she's most likely using the School of Strixhaven as a front, a place to bring in potential embers and pressure them enough until they ignite into Planeswalkers. We are left only to speculate on her intentions, but it seems as though she is aware of a coming threat, a disaster on the horizon, and she is forming an alliance of Planeswalkers to combat it. We may have been given a glimpse into the School of Strixhaven with the release of the Commander Legends product. There is a cycle of monocolored legends, each with the title of Familiar. Familiars are common companions to wizards and mages, so their appearance at Strixhaven would be natural. Furthermore, Falthus and Essior can both be seen in locations that very much resemble a school of mages, bookshelves and academy parapets. And Essior may be Kasmina's own familiar, bearing a striking resemblance to the Strix in Kasmina's transmutation, and sharing a static ability that is reminiscent of Kasmina's own. There is still so much unknown about Strixhaven and the story that will unfold within its halls. Only time will reveal it to us. This brings us to the much anticipated and potentially controversial crossover set, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. The set combines the mechanics and elements of MTG with the universe of the Forgotten Realms. The stories of the realms unfold in the world of Toril within realm space. 
I'm not well versed in Dungeons and Dragons, the world of Torel, or its history, so I'll leave this speculation to those who are more knowledgeable. I do predict a decision will have to be made in how the future of both enterprises will look after the crossover. It's true that MTG has already made an appearance in the mechanics and games of D&D, in the form of Mythic Odysseys of Theros and Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, but it will be interesting to see how the MTG story is shaped by this set. Will the realms now be considered part of the multiverse, and that the two entities will now share a common universe? Or will it be a purely cosmetic set, introducing players of MTG to the Forgotten Realms, but making a clear decision to forgo any lore or stories that will tie the two together? If they do bridge the gap, how will they seek to reconcile the fundamental differences between the two universes and how they operate? Will they make monumental changes to how we view the multiverse and the realms, or will they leave it all on the cutting room floor? The final non-supplemental sets to be released in 2021 take us back to a familiar plan, one of ghosts and monsters, of faithfully devoted and vilely abhorrent, of angels and demons, of vampires and werewolves, the plain of Innistrad. The last time we visited Innistrad, it was corrupted and transformed into a plain of eldritch horror by the Eldrazi titan Emrakul after having been coaxed by a vengeful Nahiri. Avacyn, the creation of Soren Markov and protector of Innistrad, along with her host of angels and much of the other inhabitants, had been driven mad by Emrakul's influence, although the power of Avacyn kept the Eldrazi at bay. It wasn't until Soren unmade the angel that Emrakul and her Eldrazi brood arrived. In the events of Shadows over Innistrad, Markov Manor was obliterated and the bloodline nearly wiped out. The inhabitants of the plain fought against themselves as Eldrazi magic transformed them, and broods poured forth to attack Thraben. Soren requested the aid of Olivia Voldaren in a crusade of vengeance, and the Gatewatch was mobilized to combat Emrakul. When the dust settled, the Eldrazi Titan imprisoned itself within Innistrad's moon, stating that the time was not yet right. The plane was not ready to welcome Emrakul. Avacyn and most of the host of angels, save for Sigarda, were corrupted and defeated, shattering the belief of the faithful and creating a vacuum in which the monsters of the plane could once again assert dominance. Two sets are to be released which give us a taste of what the new Innistrad will be like. They are Innistrad Crimson Vow and Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Not much is known about the sets, but they will be predominantly focused around the races of vampires and werewolves on Innistrad, hearkening back to the dark days of the plain during Avacyn's imprisonment. No doubt it will be full of terrible deeds, vile creatures, and an expansion of evil. We know that there will apparently be a vampire wedding that acts as the crux of the story for Innistrad Crimson Vow. But between whom? My theory is that it will be a marriage between Olivia Voldaren and Soren Markov, and that it will be entirely political. Olivia, after having taken Soren's sword from him, has declared herself the de facto Lord of Innistrad, and is indeed the leader of the largest and most influential vampire family. Soren has fallen from grace in the eyes of the vampires. He estranged himself by creating Avacyn in the first place, then further isolated himself by destroying her, earning him the ire of many vampires. Furthermore, his bloodline has been reduced to next to nothing, after Nahiri's attack on Markov Manor. The Markovs are in dire straits and very much need to seek allegiances and save face to survive the ruthless world that is Innistrad. For this reason, I think a marriage between the old lord of Innistrad and the new would be both plausible and quite interesting for the story. Alternatively, the wedding could be a ploy, a trap set by a lesser family to gather all of their adversaries in one spot under the guise of Bonami, then deliver a bloody and spectacular coup to seize power. But again, that's just my theory. As for Innistrad Midnight Hunt, we may see how Avacyn's curse mute at the end of the original Innistrad block has shaped the dynamic between werewolves and their non-cursed wolfier relatives. From the flavor text of Silverfur Partisan, it appears as though the number of wolfier are dwindling and the resurgence of werewolves may ultimately lead to their doom. We'll likely get another appearance of the werewolf planeswalker Arlen Kor as she navigates the forests of Kessig. The human ranger trapper duo Halana and Elena that appeared in Commander Legends seem like reasonable characters to become involved in the larger story of Midnight Hunt. With the age of Avacyn over, Innistrad is primed to slide back into the hands of devils, demons, monsters, and cultists as humanity is once again backed into a corner.
It's unlikely that Eldrazi will make an appearance again on Innistrad, and Emrakul will probably remain in her prison during the events of these two sets. But perhaps her aura will have a corrupting or unforeseen impact on the inhabitants of the plane. We may also see an appearance by the planeswalker Davriel Kane, who has been living on Innistrad in recent years. Davriel is an interesting character whose abilities have given him much power. He has a world soul entity within him that continuously whispers promises of power if only he hands over control. Only once did he give in to this entity, which occurred on an unnamed plane during the climax of a battle between two armies. The power of the entity was so great that the combating armies were both decimated and Davriel was left alone on the bloody field. This is precisely when a group of strangers, shadowy individuals intent on hunting Davriel, first made an appearance. He knew nothing other than that they would destroy him if given the chance, and so he fled to Innistrad. Years later, after a conflict between Cain and another entity known as the Bog Entity, his obscurity and presence became known to other planeswalkers. He was visited by a group of planeswalkers seeking to recruit him to their cause and offering him a portent of the future. Was this perhaps the enigmatic Kesmina and her alliance? It may be that Innistrad will shed some light. With each of the sets highlighted in a bit of detail, it's time to take a step back and assess the future of the multiverse on a grander scale. I feel as though Kasmina and the machinations of her mysterious interplanar organization will be found influencing the story of many of the future sets, which comes as quite a surprise as she has only had two cards that reference her and one paragraph of backstory. Hardly an extensive resume for such an influential character. The information we are given sends conflicting signals, a description of a shadowy cabal that essentially tortures non-ignited walkers and then indoctrinates them into their faction certainly has negative connotations, but we know that she and her organization are fearful. They can see a threat gathering beyond the horizon, one that could be so disastrous that the ends of confronting it justify the means. Already we have reason to believe that Kazmina's organization has been in contact with Davriel Kane and I now firmly believe that hers was the mysterious voice behind the Ozolith on Ikoria that pushed the Coppercoat Luca over the edge and ignited his own Planeswalker spark. It's a story that matches her motives and means of recruitment. But what is she preparing for, and why has she not enlisted the aid of the Gatewatch, an interplanar organization in its own right that has among its ranks competent and powerful individuals such as Ajani, Jace, Kaya, and Teferi? unless her purpose is more selfish and dubious than that of the Gatewatch. Or perhaps the Gatewatch itself is the threat she is so focused on combating. Many planeswalkers convened on Ravnica during the War of the Spark, no doubt sowing the seeds of resentment, hatred, and discord among hundreds of planeswalkers. Perhaps another planeswalker war, the likes of Karandors, is imminent and Kasmina is preparing her side for victory. The Eldrazi have been maimed, the Elder Dragon Nicol Bolas has been defeated, but there yet exists a threat to the multiverse that is consolidating power on the artificial plane of Merodin, New Phyrexia. Yagmoth and the Phyrexians have played the role of ultimate villains for much of Magic the Gathering's history, and although they were dealt a crushing blow by the Coalition and Legacy, the glistening oil infected Karn's plane, the designs of a glorious rebirth held within the Black Substance. This could indeed be what Kasmina is so worried about, and I have no doubts that Phyrexia will be a major antagonist in years to come. Currently, Karn has been scouring the plain of Dominaria to uncover the ancient Silex. Although not spelled the same as the Golgothian Silex used by Urza Planeswalker to defeat his brother Mishra and the Phyrexians in 64 AR, it could be this very artifact and it would make sense that Karn intends to find it so that he may once again obliterate the Phyrexians. Although we are beyond the pre-mending days of planar portals and relatively easy interplanar travel, the threat of new Phyrexia is very real. The flavor text of Elish Norn Grand Cenobite would have us believe that Phyrexia may already have discovered a new way to travel the Blind Eternities. Of course, Rashmi's planar bridge technology still exists within the Planeswalker Tezzeret, and it was used to great effect to transport an army of artificial and inorganic soldiers in the War of the Spark. Soldiers that aren't much different than the completed artifact abominations of new Phyrexia. Perhaps Phyrexian sleeper agents have already infiltrated several planes and prepared them for invasion. 
There isn't much evidence to support this claim besides taking a big conclusive leap from reading the flavor text of one card. Chromatic Orrery's flavor text tells us that another plane inspired the device, and the illustration shows us five different colored orbs circling a central one. This is an exact replica of the five sons of Marodin, the plane that gave us the original Vidalcan Orrery and that is now in the hands of the Phyrexians. Who could have created such an artifact? Maybe Phyrexian agents. New Phyrexia has also been highlighted with several cards in the recent Commander Legends set. We see Phyrexian sculptors and splicers continue the great work, constantly attempting to achieve perfection. We also see brave Miran resistance fighters taking to the skies in the card Armored Sky Hunter. Perhaps the most interesting card in predicting the future comes to us in Triumphant Reckoning. Here we see the silhouettes of the Planeswalkers Ajani, Chandra, and Karn alighting on the surface of a beleaguered world. The flavor text reads, In a flash of light and a burst of ether, despair turned to hope, and defeat turned to victory. Now this could be any plane, but Ajani and Karn have already been seen discussing the threat of Phyrexia with Teferi. I believe it is new Phyrexia, and the trio has come to the aid of Koth to help cleanse his world of the Phyrexian infection. Perhaps this is the threat Kasmina has been so worried about. But as the same with all the theories presented today, only time will tell. Thanks for watching this video on my predictions for the next year of Magic the Gathering. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel for weekly lore content. And now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on my predictions, where you think they went right and where you think they went terribly wrong, as well as your own crazy conspiracies in the comments below. This is the first video I've done on a topic like this, but I've had a blast creating it and I hope you've really enjoyed it. Let me know if you'd like more theories in the future. The references used can be found in the description. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.